The retail giant David Jones has been slapped with a multi-million dollar sexual harassment lawsuit. The room was packed this morning as Christy Fraser-Kirk had her first day in court. I am a young woman standing here today simply because I said it wasn't OK. The 31-page statement of claim details allegations of the boss's public lustings, including groping and kissing and repeated requests for sex at his Bondi apartment. Mr McInnes resigned after admitting he had behaved in a manner unbecoming. Mr McInnes and the board agree that his employment to be mutually terminated. Christy Fraser-Kirk is seeking $37 million in compensation. The money makes him more, look more like a gold digger. We often see women put on trial. And they'd really started to attacking her personally. The girl was not raped and molested. It seems like just yesterday, really. That's the program tonight, XP Company. One reason women are fed up is that stories of workplace harassment and violence come up all the time. I've been covering them on 7.30 for more than a decade. And of course, for every story that does capture the media's attention, there are countless more that don't. Years before the Me Too movement, one workplace sexual harassment case had a seismic impact on corporate Australia. Hey, Christy, can you hear me? Hey, yeah, perfect. Come on, get out of the way. Christy Fraser-Kirk was a 25-year-old publicity coordinator at David Jones when she complained about the behaviour of the company's CEO, Mark McInnes, at two work events. When it wasn't resolved internally, she sued Mr McInnes, David Jones and its nine directors for $37 million in punitive damages, a figure that Ms Fraser-Kirk said she'd give to charity. I have tried my best to have this matter resolved fairly and with justice. The case ultimately settled out of court and the damages claim was dropped. Mark McInnes has always denied the claims made against him and claimed the court action was an abusive process. 7.30 made multiple attempts to contact Mr McInnes but were unable to speak to him directly. In a statement, David Jones said the historical case is in no way reflective of its values and it does not tolerate harassment of any nature. Christy Fraser-Kirk, it's more than a decade since your case involving David Jones. How differently or otherwise do you think that that matter would be viewed or handled today? Yeah, wow, 10 years. I think, quite honestly, if David Jones had had this on their doorstep right now, I would hope that it would be handled very differently. I mean, in my circumstance, it was pretty brutal for what I had to go through. Uh, and a company that really, in those sorts of scenarios, all you really want is uh, support and to be protected from something like this. How would you describe the way that you were treated by the media at the time? And what kind of message do you think that that sent women or employees who had ever contemplated perhaps stepping up and making a complaint? Look, I, I really don't think that we want to scare monger women anymore. And... My situation was horrific, to say the least. Clearly, people weren't really ready for a 25-year-old blonde woman coming up the ranks, you know, junior publicist, to kind of call out and say, uh, that's not right. And for somebody, I guess, who had a public apology, why then was I scrutinised so heavily by the media? My personal life, you know, being attacked, any sort of area that they could find to discredit me was really, really uh, confronting for a 25-year-old woman. What impact did that have on you and what sort of got you through that? Look, it was, it was, it was devastating, but I grew up being told to call out when something was wrong. So actually when it, it happened to me, I, I didn't think any other wiser. I thought, well, well, this is what's happened. This shouldn't happen. Uh, go to your middle management, you know, report it. And the backlash that then ensued after that was pretty incredible. I had no idea the sort of media storm and public attention that this would have. And although uh, Mark McGuinness 
absolutely apologized publicly and to me personally, which I accepted, there needs to be greater accountability. When my situation happened before the Me Too movement, nobody really got it. And now there's a little change of ear which is, and a change of tune, which is refreshing. But we've got a lot of work to do. I think it's safe to say that boys clubs should be worried because that was me 10 years ago. I'm still knocking on that door, still banging on that glass ceiling now, and it's not gonna go away. Bo Pahari was promoted despite an allegation of sexual harassment. Today the Prime Minister was defending his minister for calling Brittany Higgins a lying cow. Judge Dyson Hayden has uh, had six allegations of sexual harassment by six different women. Earlier this year, it was here at Sydney's Town Hall that thousands of women rallied in protest after the Brittany Higgins case ignited national fury. There were rallies all over the country. Hers was just the latest in a steady stream of appalling stories. But the reason that it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back is that so many women from all sorts of economically and culturally diverse backgrounds have had the experience of being sexually harassed or worse in their places of work or education. One in two women has experienced sexual harassment in her lifetime. One in five has experienced sexual violence after the age of 15. Almost two in five women have faced sexual harassment in the workplace. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are more likely to experience it, as are women with a disability. The workplace situation is so concerning that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, authored the Respect at Work report to expose the full extent of what's happening and why. It came about because we had seen in the US the Harvey Weinstein reporting and it, it was sort of the conversation in Australia, the Me Too conversation started happening around dinner tables here. The Weinstein matter was actually the third major wake-up moment for corporate Australia on sexual harassment. The first was 1984, when Australia's Sex Discrimination Act came in, making it illegal to discriminate on the basis of gender and sexual identity. The next was the Christy Fraser Kirk case, when companies realised there could also be a reputational disaster which led to a tendency to try to hush cases up. Weinstein, in 2017, finally caused corporations to realise that covering up could be even more disastrous. How common is the tendency for organisations to want to impose secrecy, such as non-disclosure agreements, to protect their reputations? Up until now, uh, it has been standard practice. Actually, what you were buying as an employer was silence, so your reputation was preserved so that it didn't affect your talent recruitment. And what's been the effect of that? The effect has been employers have taken a blanket confidentiality approach. They haven't been learning right through the board lessons from cases that have gone in the past. They've also had some people become repeat offenders. How many people do actually complain? Only 17% of people who experienced sexual harassment made a complaint. The systems in place in the laws currently really rely on individuals to make complaints before any action is taken. So they're not putting the burden on employers to stop sexual harassment. They're really putting the burden on the victims to complain about it. And so that has resulted in an environment where I think employers and perpetrators are more interested to suppress the complaint than to stop the sexual harassment. Christy Fraser-Kirk now juggles motherhood with her career as a busy London executive. She manages a team herself, and that's part of the reason she decided to speak about her case on television for the first time. How would you hope things would look for your daughter when she enters the workforce? Um, you know, Lee, I wouldn't have done this interview um, had it not been for my daughter. And, you know, I realise that even still 10 years or whatever it is from now, I'm still a little bit fearful of what people will think. 
And that's not a message that I would send to anybody in my team. And more importantly, it's not the message that I would send to my daughter. So as hard as this path is to trailblaze sometimes, you gotta suck it up because that generation deserves more. Christy Fraser Kirk was a young woman when she bravely spoke up and it's young women stepping up again. My name is Maddie Fitzpatrick, I'm 24. I think among my friendship circles, it's more likely that someone's experienced sexual assault or abuse than it is for them to have not had any of those experiences. The turning point for me, and a pretty pivotal point when I realised that I was had been sexually abused, was when I was sitting in a talk in Year 12 when I first learnt the word consent. In Year 12, and I walked away from it and burst into tears and I could list over 10 different things that had happened to me. I had a boss who was basically sexually abusing me. It started just with small sexual comments. The sexual comments did escalate to touching. You know, we're learning at school that rape is gonna occur from someone jumping out on the street at you or in a dark alleyway. And so we're learning how to protect ourselves from those situations, but we're not learning how to deal with rape or sexual assault when it's occurring from people who you know. Addressing gender inequality is really about challenging these harmful stereotypes around what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman that play into violence against women. In Australia, we know men have really high rates of depression and suicidality, and that's related to these stereotypical ideas of men needing to be tough, not being able to seek help, um, boys being taught that they're not supposed to cry, and they actually have really harmful ramifications, uh, not just for women, but obviously for men themselves. What do you say to men who might feel like, well, I can't, I can't say or do anything for fear of putting a foot wrong and being accused of being a, a sexual harasser? I am really keen to encourage men to engage in this conversation. My sense is that we're at a turning point and whilst men have told me they're confused, it's time that they engage. To achieve true progress, all voices need to be heard. And some of those whose stories are often missing are those most at risk. I am Gina. I have moved from Samoa in mid-90s to Australia. I live in Merrickville. People always ask me, like, are you trans? I'm like, no, first of all, I am Gina. Hi, how are you going? Uh, good morning, hi. Can I please get a latte, please? When I was in hospitality, you know, I worked in pubs. People say I've got attitude, you know, but um, at the same time, I want to keep the, the relationships between patrons and myself in a respectful manner. But somehow, it doesn't stop patrons, especially males. Niha! The kind of things they used to say to me, like, you know, um, sexy, like, you know, uh, do you want to have lunch? Do you have a boyfriend? Come here. Come here. When you're beautiful or you're gorgeous, it's, it's kind of okay. You can take it as a compliment, but when they say sexy while you're at work. It's a different narrative. And for me, it's a constant thing. It's not just like, you know, uh, one day a week or one shift. But me as a trans woman, I would stand there thinking, what would they say after if I reveal myself to them? I don't know how they would take it. But to me, I always think of violence. Gina says for migrant women, speaking out against sexual harassment in a work environment can be particularly challenging. They fear because of being judged by their own communities and um, on top of that is the fear of losing employment. Like, you know, and I think that's what stops women from speaking, uh, speaking out. 
we found that some groups were more at risk than others. So women um, were in the majority, young people, LGBTI communities, uh, people with disabilities, migrant workers and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island workers. And we know that's because of intersecting forms of discrimination and oppression. So they are facing transphobia, sexism and racism at the same time and that intersects to cause high rates of violence and make them particularly vulnerable. Any society is only as good as how it treats its most vulnerable and in this respect in Australia we have to do better. I think we really need to question ourselves when the stories that make us angry have to come in the package of a young white woman and that is not at all to take anything away from the likes of Brittany Higgins or Grace Tame whose courage and power has been you know instrumental in sort of bringing to light these issues but the reality is that women of colour, Aboriginal women, trans women face much higher rates of violence, face much more discrimination and yet their voices are not elevated. In fact, they're often silenced. And I think we really need to question ourselves about why it is that we listen to certain voices and we turn away from others. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.